Dave Cullen, who were Eric and Dylan? Eric and Dylan were the two killers at Columbine. And Eric was a psychopath and Dylan was not. They were completely different people. And, you know, as I, I spent 10 years on this book, and the question I get asked the most often is, why did they do it? And it took me about a year to figure out that that's really the wrong question and leads us in the wrong direction because there's, there's Eric and why he did it, and there's Dylan, and they're completely different people. So do you want to talk about each one of them? Okay, so Eric was a psychopath. Classic. Eric Harris. Eric Harris. Yes, and he was the mastermind of, of the plot. And he spent a couple years trying to figure out how he could destroy the entire world. That was his real fantasy as a 16-year-old boy. Wipe out humanity, uh, always to leave three or four or five people. Because to a psychopath, the power of life as well as death makes them all more powerful. A god can give life as well as take it away. And psychopaths are not delusional where they think they're a god, but they're as if they're as important as God, and it's referred to as a messiah complex. But the key thing with a psychopath is uh, no compassion, no empathy, no regard for the welfare of others, for anything. Um, typically they're nonviolent because it's just about meeting their own needs. So you see them as white collar criminals, Ponzi schemes, con men, frequently crooked politicians. You might be able to think of a few recent ones that come to mind. Um, that's a classic psychopath. Someone who would destroy other people's lives, destroy a state or a country for the most trivial gain on their own part. So that's a psychopath, typically nonviolent. But when the person has a sadistic streak too, then you typically get uh, a Ted Bundy, a Jeffrey Dahmer, or an Eric Harris. So that's the mold he comes from. Then do you want to talk about Dylan? Uh, Dylan is completely different. Dylan Klebold. Dylan Klebold. Yeah, polar opposite, polar opposite personalities. And uh, Dylan went along with the plan, but he was not driving it. And when you look at their journals, Eric's journal is filled with hate, hate, hate all the way through. Uh, it starts out, I'll clean up one word, but the opening line is, I hate the effing world. And it's hate on every page. He started out wanting to kill, and he ended up killing over the course of a year. But with Dylan, it's completely different. He spent two years, Dylan spent two years doing his, writing his journal, and the most common word in his journal is love. It's, it, it's completely unexpected. To me, Dylan was the revelation in this case. He was a loving, sensitive boy with a whole lot of anger, but his anger was mostly directed inward. It was all angry at himself for being such a loser, such an outcast. He wasn't. It was objectively untrue, but that's how he saw it. And Dylan tried so hard loving the world and felt that the world wasn't loving him back. And gradually, he takes a really slow evolution. He, he wasn't oppressive. He, he's easily diagnosed as a classic adolescent diagnosis, but that doesn't really tell you enough. The interesting thing is watching for two years how this kid who looks like he would never kill under the influence of Eric Harris, gradually turns that anger that's turned inward out of the rest of the world. And instead of blaming me, it's blaming all the rest of you people did this to me, and I'm gonna take a lot of you with me and show you on the way out. And so Dylan still committed suicide, but took a lot of people with him. In your book, Columbine, you write, Dylan's mind raced night and day, analyzing, inventing, deconstructing. He was 15. He had tagged along on the missions. He was Eric's number one go-to guy, and none of that mattered. What were the missions? Well, the missions were, they were a really early symptom of something going awry. Um, their sophomore year, Eric and Dylan started just doing these, they were just pranks. But Eric called them the missions because he was grandiose about everything. Um, he saw them as this, this big thing where we were showing you know, people how great we were. They were just shooting off firecrackers, soaping up windows, egging houses. Then they got a little nastier, like super gluing mailboxes shut um, and so forth. And what's interesting to me about the missions is that you see a progression with Eric going from petty vandal to petty thief to uh, felony theft to murder. He didn't just start out a mass murder. He had his own gradual criminal uh, progression 
where if he hadn't done something like Columbine, it's pretty clear he would have become a career criminal of some sort. Uh, but he had that sadistic streak. So he wanted to kill people for very simple reasons, for, for his own aggrandizement and because he enjoyed it. He, he wanted to have fun and he, he wanted to show us. Uh, it's, you know, I would say it's um, understanding a psychopath it doesn't take a whole lot to understand what one is. It's a fairly simple complex. It's hard to believe that it's true, that somebody will kill some, someone. Kill, he wanted to kill hundreds of people, but will do that for, for the most pe petty gain to himself. But that, that was enough. April 20th, 1999 was the date of Columbine, the massacre at the high school there. Yes. But Eric started planning this in 1997. Yes, yes. How did you discover that? Well, they, they, kept, they kept lots of records. Um, eventually, after a seven-year legal battle, uh, Jefferson County, or Jeffco, released nearly a thousand pages of writings that the killers left. They each left a journal. Uh, they left school assignments. Uh, also, Eric wrote on his website about all he wanted to do. And then they made videotapes explaining themselves. In the last month, they decided that wasn't enough. So uh, the FBI agent in the case, who's sort of a major character in the book, sort of the unwinding of the detec detective story, he said that in his what FBI, was his name? Uh, Su Supervisory Special Agent Dwayne Fusillet, uh, very famous Hoshin negotiator, brilliant psychologist, uh, who, in an odd coincidence, happened to be uh, take over the case. Um, but he said in his entire FBI career, he'd never seen a killer who, who died leave this much material explaining themselves. So we have an extraordinary amount of information to gather. And then I spent the last several years sort of digging through all this information and, and talking with various psychiatrists and psychologists that the FBI brought in the case to understand them. It's, it's very clear cut once you dive through the information. It's, it's, it's hard to make up their handwriting. It, it, it took quite a while to sort of um, be able to decipher what they were doing. But once you understand their psychological condition, it's a lot easier to understand them too. You really have to understand what a psychopath is and how they tick to really understand how to interpret Eric. So it doesn't just sound like the rabies, because he, he follows a very classic pattern. Did Wayne and Kathy Harris recognize that Eric was in trouble? That he was in trouble, I, I said that he, and that he got in trouble, they had no idea the extent of trouble and almost nobody recognizes a psychopath. If you think about somebody like Hannibal Lecter, you have to really throw out the Hollywood version because a psychopath is never going to tell you that they're going to eat your liver. You would be the last person in the world to know they're a psychopath. The first classic book on psychopathy that was published in the 1930s by Dr. Herbie Cleckley, he titled the book The Mask of Sanity because there, there are two clusters of characteristics of a psychopath. One is their total lack of empathy the lack of compassion for everybody, uh, for anyone. But the Cleckley decided the even more important characteristics was the ability to disguise that lack of empathy, as if wearing a mask. Psychopaths are nearly always charming. They're the people we turn to to trust. Uh, after we're in bankruptcy court or divorce court, they're the person, the person you turn to for help, that is most likely the psychopath. That's how good they are. So. Parents never recognize they have a psychopath in the house. And the Harris parents knew that Eric was acting out, that he'd gotten in trouble sometimes. They, they were having him see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist put him on Zoloft. That wasn't strong enough. They put him on Luvox. Uh, they, they disciplined him strongly. So they knew they had a kid acting out, but they had, they had no idea what. And, and I want to throw out one other idea uh, for, for people to consider. Eric was gobbling up uh, Shakespeare, writing papers on uh, King Lear and Macbeth, uh, Tessa de Urbevilles, uh, Euripides, I'm, and he would write the most amazing apologies. So picture you've got a kid, he acts up, sometimes he gets in trouble, and then when he explains himself, he shows deep, utter remorse. He quotes Shakespeare in, you know, when he's talking to and, and how, you know, in King Lear he learned a similar thing there. You will give a kid like that a lot of latitude. You got a brilliant kid who seems to be just doing really well. Sometimes he gets in trouble, he acts up. So they knew they had a problem child, but what kind of parent thinks, God, he acts out sometimes. I, I wonder if he's considering mass murder. Did Sue and Tom Klebold recognize anything in Dylan? They recognized depression. They knew that he was depressed. 
They had no idea how bad it was, that it was that extreme. They didn't know that he was suicidal. He talked for two years in his journal about, about suicide.